Okay, everybody, welcome to the first EXO Extends. Glad to have you all here. My name is Janne Kalliola. I have only a couple of, couple of things to say, so I don't, I don't steal time from Demo, that has to has real be. So, truly, truly happy that you are here. The topic is extremely interesting. I'll, 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 be, I'll be writing notes at the back for the whole time, I guess. Uh, we'll video this to YouTube, so it will be streamed. So don't don't try to try not to uh, have a have a resting match with the camera, and then uh, if if you ask questions, then do it loudly so the people there they can hear, hear it also. We'll try to clip the clip the uh, clip the video later with the, with the high resolution. Also provide the slides slides to slide share. So follow EXO at Twitter. That's the easiest thing to, to keep keep in sync with with the, all of these. If you if you tweet anything about then the hashtag EXO extends everything together. Uh, that would be that would be awesome. Other than that, once again, welcome and enjoy the show. Then, okay. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Tem, and I'm from Emplica. That's the weird name on the on there. Nobody can pronounce it in English or nor in Finnish. Uh, I'm here today to tell you about open source tools for big data. Big data. And, um, when we are talking about this kind of subject, uh, I have to <coughs> warn you before that we are not going all of those through, and you will see soon why. But we are going uh, some of the things we are using at Emblica. We are using uh, to do some stuff, some analytics, some. Uh, some data pipeline or, or something else that you can do with, with the data at all. And, uh, um, well, if you have any questions, uh, I think the best moment for, for asking those is after the presentation and I'm glad to answer all those. Okay, so uh, first, yeah, uh, I come from Emlika. We're a small company, five guys, uh, five developers. We are mostly doing some data engineering, uh, DevOps and uh, machine learning stuff, uh, but we are developers, we are doing everything else too. Sometimes it's front-end development, sometimes it's back-end development, but we're mostly focusing on those. And um, uh, we, are, we are using the technologies like uh, Kubernetes or Docker, if, you're in, if you know some from the DevOps field or Ansible to automate things. And then we're doing lots of big data stuff and data engineering stuff. And there we're using uh, mostly open source projects uh, from the uh, Apache Foundation, but uh, some other projects too. But, and I'm going to go through some of those in this presentation. This one. Um, well, uh, first let's start something very, very simple. Uh, what is big data? And uh, this is a good question because if you go to university and you go to course, the, you have to write an uh, essay about that. And uh, um, well, Big Data has been for a while here, and I think it's just a buzzword, but uh, there is still something with that. And uh, well, let, let's get, get it in the scale. Uh, one terabyte of data, is it big? And so if it is. There is somebody who's like, mm, yeah, maybe. No. It depends. Well, yeah, exactly. It depends. What if the amount, what, what if one terabyte of data comes in one hour? What if it uh, comes in one day? Or what if you have to store one terabyte of data for each customer every day? This is your AWS S3 storage uh, bill after one year of collecting one terabyte of data each day, and then after that it's like this one monthly. Uh, it's not a lot if you're a big company, but if you're a startup, you may think that if you need to start. <coughs> uh, so even though uh, they say that storage is more uh, cheaper than ever, uh, it's still quite expensive if you go on that scale. Well, um, I think that big data comes, uh, there's like three kinds of big data. And uh, the first one is what we usually think about, 
the volume, that we have lots of it. We have petabytes of data there in the uh, data warehouse or something. Well, uh, there, I think there might, there can be also a very fast data, big data. So uh, data that comes in uh, super fast, like the one terabyte, um, maybe even in one second. Uh, I think at Facebook level, they are actually talking about that kind of ingest of data. But uh, then there is also, uh, if there's lots of variety in, in the data, then you might have to uh, consider these tools too. So, uh, and what I mean with variety, I mean that the data is so complex that we can't uh, structure it uh, when it comes to, to our hands, but we have to analyze it later and see that, okay, this data m meant this. And uh, then we are, I think then we are talking about big data. Uh, but as I said, we're probably not uh, in our everyday lives in the f field of Facebook, but uh, then you might ask like, is it worth to even look at the big data stuff? Because we can do fine with the MySQL, well, normal tools, normal data. Uh, I think yes, and um, why? Because uh, first, what works with petabytes of data um, almost certainly works with smaller, normal data. But there is another reason. Um, these tools are made for processing uh, multiple types of data, very complex data and, uh, well, sometimes very, very simple data too. And if we have those, uh, they might be good options to uh, control or manipulate it. Um, <clears throat> like, uh, then, then there is other tools that have the kind of like label of being big data tools, but actually they are just general processing for any kinds of data. It doesn't have to be very big. Uh, here is an example uh, that you can see very poorly. Sorry about that. Well, um, let me try to scale it up. Apparently no, but um, well, what happens here is that there is just 70 million million rows of JSON. Uh, you know what to do if you, somebody gives you a document of uh, 70 million lines of uh, JSON, JSON objects. Each line is one object. Well, you're probably going to write some script with Python or your favorite programming language, but you can also use a Spark if it's in your computer. Uh, this one is. Uh, here I, I just uh, read that one file and then I can, uh, for example, inspect the schema and I can do SQL queries on it. So they are pretty, uh, they're pretty nice tools e working with even the simple kind of data, even with little, little small data, as you might say. Um, well, uh, one thing that you can get if you write it uh, with Python the processing script, it only uses one core from your computer if you're not uh, into a multiprocessing stuff. And I think if you're just hacking away, you don't want to write that kind of stuff. Uh, <coughs> well, with uh, Spark, you will get all your cores from your working laptop uh, easily, easily in the use. Um, and uh, some <coughs> of the tools that, uh, that the big data provide you is uh, making very easy to fiddle around your data and then it's probably good reason to use them. Uh, also you will get uh, you will get very uh, fault tolerant code you will get uh, very reliable stuff. Uh, uh, the scalability there is uh, is written like that because I think it's the last argument you should have when you're selecting the tools. Uh, if you don't have the scale from the start, don't think about the scalability then, but think about, think about it later when you actually have the scale, huge data sets. Um, but you will also get working models uh, of processing the data. So somebody have already used her brains to find out what happens uh, when, let's say, your program crashes or uh, find out uh, how sessionization is done correctly. And those are the things you, you should consider using the big data tools. 
Uh, <clears throat> if you're a programmer, how many of you are? Yeah, lots of. Um, you're using libraries for doing even simpler tasks than some big data processing, so why don't you use the libraries then when you have that kind of stuff? Um, <clears throat> but uh, it doesn't mean that you have to. Uh, the normal Python hacks, they work just fine. Here, for example, uh, is one of the one file I'm developing with. Uh, it's part of the bigger data set of Big Data. Uh, the data set size is, uh, I think it's something like 120 terabytes. And uh, there I just took a little part of it because I don't want to develop it with 120 terabytes with my, in my computer. Uh, unfortunately, they don't make that big hard disks yet for the MacBook Pros. But uh, here I can use just uh, normal Unix tools to get it through and find out some, some things I want to know about the data without even loading it in the, in the spark. Um, so in, in that context, I could say that uh, using Hadoop or something else nonsense well, <clears throat> speaking about Hadoop, uh, I think Hadoop is kind of like the start of the history of data processing with free software, and I mean now big data processing. Um, it starts from uh, Lucene, uh, from the Yahoo. Um, Doug Cutting, named fella, uh, were developing a <coughs> search engine at Yahoo, and uh, Later, at two, uh, 2001, uh, he finally open sourced it and moved it under the Apache Foundation. And you might know Apache Web Server, yeah, it's the same foundation on, on top of it. Uh, the, then the project still uh, continued. After, after a while, um, another fella named uh, um, Kerr Fella joined uh, with, uh, with the Dog, and uh, they, they started a project called uh, Apache Nutch. And the Nutch was an uh, idea that they wanted to make an open source solution for crawling uh, the internet and indexing all the web content. And they wanted to make all the tools for making that possible. Uh, after a while, um, Google published uh, its white paper about GFS, Google File System. And uh, in that white paper, there was described uh, methods of handling, uh, well, let's say in that time, big data, uh, huge chunks of data, just the easiest way to store them and to manipulate them. And uh, careful and cutting implemented the whole white paper uh, under the Nudge project. Well, time goes by. Uh, there comes MapReduce white paper, and they're implementing that too. And uh, then at 2006, they moved the NDFS, which is the file system implementation, and MapReduce related code base to another project called Hadoop. And well, then it started. Uh, people started to think about how the big data is coming and uh, everything's exploding and things are going to change. <clears throat> in 2011, even in Finland, uh, PV wrote that now it's now it's hot now now we are going to do something with big data and uh, they were speaking about Hadoop nothing else was in the technology field then back then and I think nowadays still people are talking about Hadoop when they are talking about big data a lot well the reality nowadays looks like this uh, lots of fancy logos and <coughs> all of them are be uh, some kind of uh, data, uh, well, they are focused on doing something with large part uh, of the of the scheme. Uh, there, for example, uh, there is the well, I think I forgot the Hadoop, but <laughs> well, there is the Hadoop Hive project, which is a data warehouse project under the Hadoop project. Uh, there is lots of uh, there is databases. There is uh, there is data processing utilities. Uh, there is something for the visualization, there is uh, data warehouses, data pipelines, uh, search engines, and uh, now, 
like there isn't everything there is just part of it actually a very very small part but what's funny is that uh, it looks like that most of the open source projects comes from the company uh, companies somebody is writing white paper that they have done some kind of solution for handling massive amounts of data and then after a while for a while uh, they are uh, well they can open source themselves or somebody is happy enough and they are making their own open source uh, implementation uh, like uh, where they are using the ideas from the white papers uh, well for example um, well there is no the, not Kafka yet but for example Kafka comes from LinkedIn or uh, Bigtable uh, comes from Google Dynamo comes from AWS and uh, they have their their open source implementations. Uh, then there is companies who are offering consulting and uh, additional development on those products, uh, for example, data stacks or Elastic or Confluent. Well, um, I think when we're talking about big data, there is lots of different kinds of data there, what we want to talk about. Uh, one very big thing uh, is activity data, uh, which is click streams or app usage. Uh, it's, it's usually very, very structured. So then we are not talking about uh, the unstructured data problems, but we are just talking about huge amounts of it. Uh, there is uh, usually the thing that, um, that people want to keep them uh, like they, they want it to be reliable like you don't want to <coughs> use the credit card transactions or something when you're analyzing them or <coughs> anything else uh, then another thing is that they usually don't need so much um, pre-processing to actually being useful for you you can do analytics on just on one part of the data it's just huge shit <coughs> then there is uh, sensor data. We are talking about IoT devices. Um, you have your Uber in your phone. It sends the location data uh, to Uber or that kind of stuff. It's a, uh, it's a little bit. Uh, there is something similar. It's usually structured, but uh, the thing is that you're not usually doing anything with just single point of data. But you need to have uh, lots of that and then make the analytics or something based on that. Uh, <coughs> good thing is that uh, with, with the um, activity data, you can't usually compress it very much. Like you don't want to compress the um, transactions of money. But with the sensor data, you can usually compress. Like uh, after for a while, you can be just like, okay, uh, I knew that this guy was in Helsinki. We don't need to exactly know that he was in Tel or something, or there might be some some machine in some some industrial machine that tells that its temperature is constant constantly uh, 27 degrees. We can just say the data points <coughs> from uh, like if it if it sends uh, each data point in one minute, we can just send the daily average or something. So we can compress data easily. Uh, then there is a third, third kind of data, unstructured data. This is the uh, hardest field in big data processing because it's something that is actually structured, but we don't just know yet how. And that's why when we are using that kind of data, we have to process it first to get some useful metrics. So uh, we have to, for example, if we have uh, chat logs, we probably have to first apply some natural language processing to get some some data out of it. We don't do anything with, with chat itself, the data, but with the product. Or with the photos, you have thousands of photos of cats. Well, uh, nowadays we can do a lot of uh, with them, but we can apply some machine learning model, maybe some neural network to tell that there is cats and that's just label that's just uh, easy way to have the, have the structure for the data uh, 
and uh, well, this one is usually um, that way complex too. That it's uh, they are larger. If you ha if you can just tell that in this picture there was a cat or dog, it's a few bytes. But if you have to show the, all the pixels that describe the cat or dog, then you have to store lots of lots of data. Uh, so, um, what are you using the Pansy logos for? Um, one case uh, we recently came uh, was um, uh, event sourcing SQL databases. Our client had a, a Perl backend, and uh, they actually had got um, lots of those systems, and they they got MySQL database, and uh, uh, it was. Uh, the, the state in the database was point in time. So <clears throat> each time you deleted something, it actually deleted from the, from the database, you added something, it created a new row. Uh, and they wanted to uh, make some analytics. They wanted to have history of what's happening in the database, what's happening in the, in the software. And <clears throat> they, well, we could have touched the backend code, but we didn't want because, well, touching Perl is like, you know, well, maybe somebody wants to do that, but not me. Uh, so we use this one. Uh, it's a uh, Gendesk, you might know it's a uh, ticket uh, help desk software. Uh, they have made Maxwell uh, a project and uh, it streams all the changes in the MySQL uh, as JSON events forward. So, if you are inserting something, uh, once again, I'm sorry that it's very small text, but if you're inserting something uh, into the database, you will get instantly event describing that change. So uh, we had uh, the processes where, and the databases where the data was lying. Uh, we put the Maxwell data to read the binary log logs, and we stream all the changes to Apache Kafka. And now I'm going to uh, tell you another tool, Apache Kafka. It's a distributed event-only log. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, you can only read from it, and you can uh, like you can only read uh, read from the log log position and and the events put there, but you can't modify uh, modify the events after you have put them in. Uh, <coughs> well, there is some some nice features about it. Uh, it's used in LinkedIn to stream like millions of messages per second. But the one thing that uh, the one feature that it's very nice for to keep uh, keep the order between the events. So, for example, you want to uh, have all of those database updates on order, so you can do something with the events. And um, what we're doing is we are materializing all of the events from the uh, databases and then we can anal uh, do some analytics or fraud detection or uh, save all the events to do, some, to do some later analysis on them or we could dispatch some events Let's say that you want to change your name in the, in the <coughs> user customer database. If you change your name, uh, there will be new event that your name changes from this to this. And then they can send you a card, for example, like, hello, you change your name, congratulations, it's nice. Uh, <coughs> or if you change your address, because the first one is a little bit creepy, I think. Um, well, um, to get all of those uh, change changes in the databases causes lots of data. So then you had first you didn't have a problem, uh, except that you didn't have history. Now you have a problem because you don't probably want to save all the history, and for that you want to process the data somehow. Uh, we chose Apache Spark, third tool today. Uh, <coughs> Apache Spark to go through the stream and. Just, uh, just process that kind of stuff we wanted to have. We wanted to, uh, we wanted to make something with. Uh, 
Apache Spark is uh, is a general processing framework. Uh, it's distributed, so you can put it on many machines. But uh, we we in that case we just uh, went with two instances, so not lots of compute capacity. Uh, the thing is why it's very fast is that it processes all the data in memory. So when you're moving the data between two machines, it doesn't store on the disk first and then read it back there. Back there. Um, <coughs> and uh, it, uh, it has uh, it has concept called RDD, uh, which partitions the data in the little pieces that can be uh, processed again if it fails. So if there is some problem during the calculation, you can always calculate the little part, little piece of the data again. <coughs> Finally, we uh, stored that uh, with the analytics case, we stored all the data into Elasticsearch, which is another uh, open source project. So now there is uh, three, I don't know, I mean four or five projects. And, uh, and then we could uh, offer the analytics view for the guys working in that company. That they could see that how much their users are spending money for, for what, and uh, <coughs> they could do it with the uh, Kibana, which is visualization layer on top of the Elasticsearch. <coughs> I think uh, it's good if you have some questions in this part because now then we are going into another. Case. Uh, you, met, you mentioned Kappa. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, it wasn't really cl clear what is this kind of like a Kappa architecture. You oh. discussed the word there. Okay. Uh, yes. Let's go back there because uh, I think uh, I skipped it because uh, it was in a little bit wrong position if you don't know the tools. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, the Kappa architecture, it's. Um, if you know what's uh, Lambda architecture, it's not the same as AWS Lambda. But, um, the point is that, uh, that you have events coming in and you process all of those events when they come and you modify the state. So for example here, um, you can see it probably. Um, so for example here, um, this is word count made uh, with Kappa architecture. Uh, <coughs> word count, well, if, if it's uh, not, not clear, everybody, what it means, it's just like uh, somebody sending you words and you keep count um, how many words you have seen. And this is very classical. It's like a uh, hello world of big data. So uh, with traditional uh, Lambda architecture, you would first count the same style than here with the Kappa architecture, but after the day, you would also do batch job to do uh, the process through all of those data points that came uh, into your, your machines that day. So uh, batch processing, you might have the whole text like dog all, all cat, cat dog, 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 and then you might just count how many words you have seen how many distinct words you have seen. But with Kappa architecture, you're keeping a point in time state. So first you might have a state that there isn't no words and no counts. Then you might have your first, uh, first word, let's say all, and now your state would be all is one. So, so you have seen one. And uh, this one goes forward, um, if you have if you have, let's say, card service in the in the uh, e-commerce shop, you might have first your uh, product count, like how many products you have in your store. Let's say you have three cakes and <coughs> and uh, three uh, sandwiches, and then somebody is uh, somebody wants to buy one one sandwich. Uh, he could just send you an event sandwich minus one. And then you can decide that if you have one sandwich, you can process it and then your state will be a sandwich is minus one and the guy has in his card uh, sandwich plus one. So
So uh, then you can process this one, this event stream on, ta on, on, like on your own speed. And that's the thing that causes latency. You can write lots of events and they are on the order of uh, when they have sent, sent to you. And you can read at any time from the memory and it's very, very fast because you don't have to do any transactions or something like that. But you may, ha may have, um, well, you may have kind of like old data there or not yet updated data. And uh, then the another problem is that if, if some of the event is missing, then you might have problem. And actually, actually this one is the, is the thing why, why the uh, Kappa architecture isn't yet very popular. Because, uh, because we didn't have that kind of technology that we can keep all the events safe. And then uh, companies were using Lambda architecture to first count some approximation. And then they are going late at night, they are going with patch job and they are going through everything and fixing all the problems they have seen from, the data, from that data, from that counting. Did I answer to your question? Um, well, let's go to another case. <coughs> so recently, uh, we've been starting work with one customer. We are doing the uh, analytics pipeline for them. And uh, well, this one is the every analytics pipeline ever implemented. Because it's so high level that <laughs> you can't really disagree with me with that. Uh, in the start, you have user agent. For example, Netflix or YouTube, your, your phone application, it sends analytics events somewhere to tell you what you, uh, tell them what are you doing there. Uh, and actually I can um, show you, let's see, yeah. So uh, here is uh, my user agent. Oh no, you can't see that. Well, no, you can't. So uh, here is user agent, uh, very simplistic. It doesn't send anything to anywhere, but it shows you what kind of events comes from when you're playing some video. And this is just one example. They might do it differently, but this is one implementation of anal video analytics. So when you're starting to play the video or you can't decide, there might be some content start. And then when you're continuing to watch the, watch the movie or or some video clip, it can send some periodic events like, hey, you're still watching it, he's still watching it, he's still watching it, and then you're going to uh, have a more frames. It might send that he paused it in this moment, and there might be some faults in the code that sends the periodic event even after you have stopped already watching the content. And then when you go back and it will send more, more events to the back, and now the thing is that uh, <coughs> it sent these events to the back end and uh, at reality we want to know what's happening in the user's browser when, when he is watching movies in, at our site. And for that we need to reconstruct the user session, like what, what do I have done in the user agent. And uh, for that uh, you will get the events and you can model back uh, from the samples so the events you can model back the user session and you can uh, make something like you can you can have some metrics about it like how long did I watch the movie or how long <coughs> did I take a break like or uh, I stopped at 150 why like, you can have that kind of numbers but uh, the way they are usually doing it is uh, sending samples about the session. Uh, next one is super, super little picture and I think we're not going through it. Um, but what happens is that when the events come in, they are uh, somehow uh, changing the state. And that way you can get the actual session that the user had through. But well, in virtual form. Uh, for example, here, 
it might uh, the for example if you use spark or some other big data analytics processing framework or some other you might have concept of session and when you start it uh, it might create a new one like demo here uh, just started to watch this one this content it, he started it at 7 17 Oh, nine and uh, then it goes forward there comes new events you want to process them and when you're uh, when you end up uh, stopping your your session it might <coughs> save the session and then for from four events you will get just one session even and this is the point of uh, big data processing there we just uh, reduced four events to one event that has more content, more uh, actual stuff about the user session than those four events. <coughs> well, um, this was where sampling every five seconds, how long I'm, I'm watching it. Uh, well, let's say it's uh, like 15 minute video. It, it takes uh, probably 200 events to get it through. When you're watching it, it will it will uh, generate 200 events. So, if you are using some some big data processing or any processing to compress those as a session, uh, well, you just save it 200 times the space. If you're watching a one one and a half hour movie, then it's a thousand times uh, of the data, a bit smaller. And then it's not a problem to use ordinary tools anymore. So big data processing tools are used for reducing the data amount to that, that you can actually do something about it, something with that. And if, if you, uh, well, if you don't, don't have a uh, den so small that you can, you can manipulate and do stuff with that, then you can aggregate it more, like from to daily or hourly aggregates. Well, uh, I think next uh, next is the question question thing. So uh, in that point, thanks for for it, and please ask me questions if you have anything. Uh, regarding that kind of like a session thing, and I'm actually more interested about the actual architecture. Is that would you actually act publish the session also on the stream or if you post it to some other service? Yeah, uh, well, in that case, in that uh, case, uh, we did actually publish this one session uh, to another, well, we, we got these events from Kafka and we are pushing it back to Kafka as sessionized event. Yeah. And then we are processing <coughs> it forward to uh, make, for example, um, now this one is describing one session, you are watching one video, but we might want to have a session for a uh, user that comes to site and watches like three videos after each one. And we want to have that kind of session too. So we're doing the two layer session chasing. But yeah, yeah, that's usually. Uh, if you have a very simple case, then you um, might want to save it straight away from here uh, to some, some persistent <coughs> storage. Or then if you need to have a real time view of the sessions you want to know that hey these are actually now currently in real time watching then you might need some uh, some quicker storage for example Cassandra you could put the open sessions there or you could keep the state in Cassandra too yeah. any other questions yep. if is this big data it's usually just streams um well uh, no uh, as as I said, I actually there was the types of the types of the data. Um, well, activity data and the sensor data they are both pretty much streams. But uh, then from the unstructured data, there comes the uh, big huge batches of data. The streams are pretty popular nowadays. Uh, people like to keep that abstract, even though it's not really a streaming data. But uh, the it's uh, yeah it's it's like major major of the big data uh, big data 
data stuff is is actually strange. Basically, this abstract which is used. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. More like abstract. Like like any data. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it it makes some some stuff simpler. Um, and uh, currently, uh, lots of the tools are going in that direction that they want to uh, support more the stream abstraction. For example, uh, Apache Spark is itself just uh, it's it's suited <coughs> well for batch processing, uh, and then we are not talking about streams. But then there is Spark Streaming, which is a new project, and it has the concept of streams, and and there all that kind of cases come come from from that perspective. Basically, the, there are streams, events, and states. Those yeah, yeah, that, that's that's the that's the. Like, like in one one sentence, the whole stream process. Stream machine which pro produce something. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, there is uh, uh, there is also stuff like uh, sometimes there might be some some um, some jobs that do with photos, for example. You have to batch process lots of photos or lots of videos to produce something. Uh, well, may probably. Uh, go through some machine learning model to have some structure about it or, or some metadata about it or then just to let's say resize pictures or something some that kind of stuff but uh, it's not it's not so usual than the streaming like, like normal cases where <coughs> nowadays companies may encounter they are usually streaming that uh, then there's one thing uh, it's uh, it's about uh, current data um, analytics. You want, might want to do some analysis on all the whole history of your data, and it might be so big that you can't uh, do it in real time. So then you don't you're not using the streaming technologies either, but you're using you're just processing whole set of data, whole history, and you will get some numbers and that's all. Yeah, there, there is. Uh, there is actually lots of um, public data from from governments, especially. Uh, they are producing the uh, data. Then there is, uh, for example, uh, taxi um, taxi driving statistics from the U.S. Uh, I think from the New York. Uh, they are offering that free, and they are uh, pretty popular data sets for for inspecting that. Then uh, for the unstructured data, there is, for example, Wikipedia dumps, and there is also Wikipedia uh, Wikipedia events, like what's happening in Wikipedia, and I think you can nowadays get them even the real time stream from from the Wikipedia that what's happening currently in Wikipedia, and it's it's pretty pretty nice to try out new tools. And So in the beginning, you mentioned that there's also some non-open source tools that you use. Uh, I'm just curious uh, what they are and why you chose those ah. instead of some others. Yeah, uh, well, uh, most of the not open source tools we're using is uh, on the visualization layer. Because uh, nowadays, even though there is a few, for example, um, where is the logo pattern? Yeah, for example, the Zeppelin, or then, uh, then of course Kibana to. Oh wait, it's not that slide. Uh, here we go. So, uh, for example, uh, Zeppelin is uh, open source. It's le it's like a notebook or that kind of tool. Uh, then there is. Uh, uh, it's not. I think it's not there, but there is. Uh, for example, the. Uh, wait a minute. Here we go. Yeah, well, for example, Superset or Metabase, they are pretty good uh, visualization layers, but uh, they're still not as useful as, for example, Tableau, which is commercial software. And uh, th those are pretty good. Then um, from the data storage, uh, data storage we are using in lots of the customer cases, Amazon Redshift. And, uh, what is Redshift? It's a columnar database. 
uh, for analytics analytics purposes, and uh, it has a little bit same uh, properties uh, from the analytics query perspective than PostgreSQL, but it works for with very large data sets. And there is not very good open source alternatives for that. Just for example. Other way around, then, are there any good commercial solutions for these that you have the open source versions? Is there also commercial space for these kind of solutions you have actual? Uh, well, uh, yes. Um, there is uh, some some solutions from uh, Oracle and IBM, but uh, well, I can't say that they are uh, they are too well because their licenses are usually too high for just trialing out if they work for the use case. Uh, and uh, there is not very good uh, good uh, cloud subscriptions for uh, data processing stuff. Then there is of course uh, uh, more like platform as a service stuff. Uh, for example, Google's Dataflow is pretty good uh, alternative for the Spark, usually Spark data pipeline. Or then there is, uh, for example, Amazon Kinesis uh, which is compared, which can be compared to Apache Kafka, and uh, and yeah, and those are pretty good commercial alternatives for teams. Uh, then uh, here was actually the slide about uh, some projects that comes from the commercial background. For example, um, well, DFS uh, like HDFS, well. Most people use S3 for that kind of stuff, and S3 has very good integrations with the tooling, open source tooling. Uh, or then Cassandra, I think most people use uh, with Amazon, they are using the Dynamo, Amazon Dynamo, for uh, handling that kind of data workload. I have one question. Yep. So about the costs of running this, so yeah, certainly data storage is, is one cost, but then the compute instance is, is another, so how how relevant is that in your projects and how much effort do you put into sort of optimizing the cost, so how do you select the size of your instances versus yeah. uh, well big instances versus a large number of smaller instances, plus when you run your loads, if they are batch processing? Yeah, uh, well, if they are batch processes, uh, then we are usually, uh, well, uh, first point, uh, it's the thing that sometimes people are asking, like, why we are, do why we are doing the DevOps and data engineering stuff. Well, they are related to each other because uh, we try to automate all <laughs> those processes. So uh, when, when it comes that uh, we have to batch process some data, uh, we are asking for from the customer that, okay, how much, uh, how much you want to pay for this or more like uh, how much you want to spend time on this and then we can just uh, scale it up and see how, how it how it performs if it looks like that it's underperforming because of the code then we can make some uh, adjustments and scale it down for, for, for a while and then just use the automation tools and get it back up and uh, well some sometimes uh, the customers are a little bit worried, like how much it's going to cost, especially with the streaming streaming applications, because then the uh, then the nodes are running all the time, and there there we can um, well of course we can uh, see if we can do more aggregations, for example, uh, before the data goes to the store, or we can. Um, we can think that if we don't need some data, we can filter it out, and then we don't need so much uh, capacity. But it's it's very, very much it depends on the context and that kind of stuff. We are going to think about uh, we are thinking about those aspects, but not so much that it's an issue. <coughs> uh, is there any local uh, open source community around these products in, or these systems in Finland? Uh, well, so, uh, with some of them, yes. Um, there is a Helsinki Big Data Meetup group, but uh, not it's not very uh, popular yet. Uh, I think 
I think the big data tools and the community around it is very, very small. And uh, that, that can cause, lot of, that's, I think that's the reason for the problem that there is not so much people around these things. There is also like, I think, a Kafka meetup that oh, just yeah. started like uh, three last month. Or yeah, so. yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I couldn't get there, but uh, it's, it's interesting. I think uh, about the tools, uh, people are using uh, sometimes the Hadoop but the Kafka seems to be more and more popular <coughs> nowadays. Uh, it's also because it's being, it's being developed very fast and there is now new Kafka, um, Kafka processing framework uh, or Kafka streams as they say, and it's kind of like the LAM uh, Kafka architecture implemented straight with, uh, uh, with very good uh, integration to Kafka itself. Nothing else, uh, be free to ask me and I'm getting a few drinks here with you, so just come to 